I'm John Kessler. I've been making kinetic sculptures since my first show at Artist Space in 1983. My real education began when I discovered the industrial surplus stores on Canal Street. I'd buy the owner's coffee, and they'd teach me how to wire up used washing machine parts. My sculptures from the 80s and 90s used found objects, lights, and motors to make assemblages that referenced things like Japanese gardens, hyperreality, and dystopic science fictions. I was drawn to gaudy colors, kitschy figurines, and fake plants. If the previous generation were making pictures of pictures, I, along with sculptors of my generation, such as Kuhns, Gober, and Seinbach, were making things of things. But my work never fit that comfortably into my group. And the reason is because my work moved. Performative sculptures is how I like to think of them. I was always interested in the active viewer, getting people to pull back the curtain and see for themselves what made the magic happen. I've been influenced by other artists who saw the optimistic and pessimistic potential of using machines in their work. Artists like Nam June Pike, Rebecca Horn, Jean Tanglet, and Bob Rauschenberg. After 9-11, the work changed when I introduced video into my sculptures. I couldn't get the image of what the terrorists would have seen out of my head, the ter what the terrorists would have seen from the hijacked planes, so I decided to try to reproduce it using postcards of the Twin Towers and a tiny surveillance camera. The introduction of this new medium, video, sent the work into a different direction, one that was more socially and politically charged. One Hour Photo was a centerpiece for a show of new video works in 2005 called Global Village Idiot that implicated the viewer, casting, <laughs> casting the audience as spectator and performer, voyeur and exhibitionist. The following year, The Palace at 4 a.m. at PS1 MoMA was my first installation. 10 miles of cables, 60 mechanisms, hundreds of monitors came together to form the piece that I think of as my apocalypse now. My trip up the river, trying to come to terms with the insanity which was that war in Iraq. Subsequent installations have included subjects such as the drop shipping of the military American, the American military industrial complex, the alienation and the isolation of the subject in a hypermediated world, and the cultural shift that's gradually occurred as we humans have become better trained robots and learn how to communicate through digital interfaces and backlit screens, the web. And that brings me to the reason I'm here today to talk about my new installation, The Floating World. The Floating World is about climate change, melting icebergs, rising sea levels, stronger storms, and more severe droughts. Now, I know that sounds really cheerful, but just as the palace at 4 a.m. addressed the war in Iraq as art, I don't want this piece to be purely didactic. I want to use the subject matter as a material to be sculpted. I've spent months doing research and talking to scientists about the impacts of climate change and trying to understand why we keep kicking the can down the road so that our lifestyles are not affected. Pope Francis is going to be in my piece <laughs> because, because he's become such an outspoken activist for climate change. For him, it's a moral question. What does it mean that we're losing plant and animal species that Noah worked so friggin' hard to get on his boat? <laughs> he's pointing his finger at the relationship between global capitalism and extreme poverty, how the world's fattest, richest nations have impacted the ecosystems of the world's poorest. The title, The Floating World, comes from the, from the woodblock prints known as yukio-e that were popular in Japan from the 17th to the 19th century. They portrayed the pleasure palaces where the Japanese went to consume and escape from the social ills of their day, like extreme poverty. 
And it's that sense of escapism that I'm going to try to capture in Kesslerized mechanical versions of those woodblock prints in my installation. My floating world is going to be a 40-foot bouncy castle that, that's a, that looks like an iceberg that's constantly inflating and deflating with the help of this guy, an animatronic polar bear with an air conditioner on his back. <laughs> Viewers will explore the caves and tunnels of the iceberg, and there they will discover the mechanisms which send live video images back that are hallucinogenic mix of erotica and calamity. Meanwhile, projections of flight attendants welcome the audience in, beckoning them to maybe log on to a hotspot and join the Mile High Club. There's one moment when disco lights in, that are embedded in the iceberg come alive, and the flight attendants join together in song, and the, and the piece becomes a delirium of fossil fuel burn and climate change denial. Like all my, re, like all my work, the floating world entertains, exploits, and critiques all at the same time. So why am I here? I'm, I'm looking for venue. This piece is actually a commission from the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. But before it goes 10,000 miles away to its new home, I'd love it to be shown here. So I'm looking for venues that would be interested in this chilling installation about an increasingly hot topic. Thank you very much. <laughs>